My name's Kathy Brew. I'm a filmmaker and curator, and I teach in two departments here, MFA Art Practice and MFA Computer Art. And along with those two departments and five others, MF, I want to make sure I get these right, MFA Art Writing, MFA Fine Arts, MFA Social Documentary, MFA Photography, Video, and Related Media, and BFA Fine Arts. I want to welcome you all to the ninth edition of Political Advertisement, 1952 to 2016. This evening's presentation is also being co-presented by Electronic Arts Intermix, a New York-based nonprofit media arts organization that's celebrating its 45th anniversary. And they feature Montadas's work in their collection and for distribution. For the past 32 years, artists Montadas and Reese have been compiling a history of presidential campaign spots following the evolution of political advertising from its beginnings to the present day. Each election year, they have presented the most recent version, a personal vision of how politics and politicians are presented through the medium of television. Clearly, this has been quite an unusual campaign year. So tonight, we will see the evolution of the selling of the American presidency from the 1950s up until today. But first, a brief introduction to tonight's artists and moderator. Montadas was born in Barcelona and has lived in New York since 1971. His work addresses social, political, and communications issues, the relationship between public and private space within social frameworks, as well as channels of information and the ways they may be used to censor central information or promulgate ideas. He works on projects in different media, such as photography, video, publications, multimedia installations, and the internet. Marshall Reese is a Brooklyn-based artist working in various media, including video, information networks, custom hardware and software ed editions, and temporary public art events. Since the mid-80s, he's collaborated with Nora Ligorano as Ligorano Reese. As it relates to election campaigns, Ligorano Reese have presented seven site-specific public works at the US political conventions, focusing on climate and political issues. This summer, for both the RNC in Cleveland and the DNC in Philadelphia, they unveiled a 4,000-pound sculpture carved in ice spelling out the words, the American dream, that clearly had its meltdown. I was there for the Philadelphia experience. It was quite, a, quite an afternoon. After the screening of political advertisement, writer Michelle Goldberg will be in conversation with the artists. Michelle Goldberg is senior contributing writer to Slate.com and the author of several books. Her work has also appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Newsweek, Rolling Stone, The Nation, The Guardian, and many others. So first we'll have Montadas come up. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Kathy, Kathy Brew, for making this event possible. And thank you, Michelle Goldberg, to join us tonight. Yes, political advertisement started in 1984, and has been already 32 years since the beginning. Probably is the longest film since the uh, film exists. Every four years, we go through similar process, observing the media, recollecting images, choose and edit what we think are the more significant ads that represent a spectrum of political advertisement, reflecting both the political arena and also the current production of image in the form of publicity for each possible candidate. Editing involves a process of decision making, also, as an art practice, we relate the editing process to a significant reference in the history of using and recycle image work as photomontage in the 30s, with some prominent artists as Herfield and Renault, and the film and video montage of the 60s and 70s as reference, also strategies to present and to make aware of the power image on the political arena. Images are speaking by themselves. And viewing, like in this case, in a chronological order, we propose a reading of the evolution of the image through 64 years and how they are important tools to understand the different use and methods since the start of the political campaign and elections. Since the start of the 50s, the continuous production of political advertisement, its techniques and formats has been changed. 
are reflecting the chain and amount of people involved in this process, the campaign manager of each party, the political advisors, their marketing strategies, the advertising agencies' teams, the art directors, and finally, their editors. All of them are part of a chain of crucial significance, the final political consequences as the money involved in, the, in each election. Every four years, the money increase and represent an important and significant amount of an industry that helps to create and manipulate their audience, their voters, and finally, the elections. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, so when Antoni uh, showed me his rough cut in 1984, I, re I remember being very vividly um, surprised by it and, and interested, remembering a number of the spots uh, that I'd seen as a child. I guess Antoni uh, recognized my enthusiasm and, and invited me to collaborate with him, which I uh, uh, energetically and gratefully accepted. I didn't think in 1984 that I'd be in New York uh, tonight, uh, 32 years le later, addressing an audience. But over time, I've come to look at this material slightly differently. Of course, in 1984, when Antoni first showed me it, I was nostalgic. I, as a baby boomer growing up in a period of uh, unprecedented prosperity and expansion of uh, civil and human rights, felt that, uh, that political advertisement was this type of exuberant expression of values central to uh, representative democracies. But over time, <laughs> I've, uh, my, my enthusiasm has tempered a bit. And I'm not really sure that uh, thinking about uh, the marketing of ideas or even a, a marketplace for expressing them is adequate to the problems and uh, d difficulties we have. In fact, I think that it uh, compounds it. Because at this juncture in our history, a supermarket is probably not the best forum for democracy. And uh, I don't want to add anything else uh, to say other than to invite Michelle Goldberg to say a few words. So when um, when Tadas and Reese first asked me if I was interested in coming to speak tonight, I was a little bit hesitant because, you know, I live and breathe politics. I'm a political journalist. I, you know, especially in this election, it takes up every crevice of my life where my family isn't. I dream about this campaign and the idea of watching another 90 minutes of political advertisement seemed like a really grim punishment, but <laughs> I watched the video regardless, and I found it completely mesmerizing. I mean, both as a way to step back from the madness and the immediacy of what's going on right now and what might be our last presidential election, and also just as this kind of sweeping panorama of America over 60 years. I mean, you'll see, you'll, you'll see in this film that this changing aesthetics, a changing set of assumptions, a changing set of characters of who can be in political advertisements, um, a kind of growing cynicism. I mean, some of the early ones are so striking to me because of the amount of faith they place in the viewer to be able to follow semi-complex arguments or to be interested in kind of substantive debate that pretty much goes away by some of the later advertisements. And the other thing, as someone who, you know, it for me, it's, it's very difficult for me to think about this aesthetically. I don't come out of the art world. And so the other thing that I find fascinating is that you can see a narrative, or, you know, I might be reading into it a narrative of, of certain, um, certain images, certain, ideas, certain phrases, building to the crudeness of, you know, make America great and, and drain the swamp. And you sort of see, at least I see, 
um, Trump as the distillation of some of what of of kind of an evolution that wends its way through through this film. But one of the remarkable things about it, I think, is that whatever message there is here is is very subtle, and you know, and and to be there's parts of it that I was positive were intentional political messages, and then in talking to the filmmakers, I find out that they weren't because it's it, it invites so many um, different readings and, and different reactions. So I think you'll find it fascinating. Thanks. Thank you for, uh, for coming tonight. Um, Uh, Michelle, I, I, since you are so much a part of this world, well, look at it so closely, <laughs> I wonder if you want to just begin by saying a few things of what came to mind. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, I think that one of the things that first of all comes to mind is the question of how much longer this art form, if you want to call it an art form, is even going to last. I mean, it must have been such a strange thing putting it together in a cycle that was in some sense kind of proving the inefficacy of television ads. You know, it was it's fascinating to remember how many ads Jeb Bush ran and the fact that Donald Trump never ran any at all. And some of the most emblematic ads that he ran weren't on television. They were Instagram ads or Twitter ads. Um, you know, to me, the ad that sums up the Donald Trump campaign, maybe some of you saw it, was a Twitter ad in which Bill Clinton, since um, very suggest suggestively smoking a cigar while um, disembodied voices of women talk about being sexually assaulted by him and Hillary Clinton cackles like the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, you know, to that like telegraphed the campaign that Donald Trump was going to run, but it wasn't on. But it wasn't on television, and so I think there's been a debate for a long time about how much television ads truly matter. Um, and I'm curious about wh where you guys stand on that and whether that's changed as you know, as we've moved into a cycle with like different kinds of spectacles and different kinds of communications? Well, I'll, be, I'll begin maybe when Taz wants to come in. I mean, I think that uh, what I find of interest is how technology is pushing all this forward. Um, you know, in the beginning it was uh, television, which was a, a very uh, select medium because wealthy people had it in the beginning. And uh, as it proliferated, it became more convenient to express political messages. I think now, and particularly, uh, we're in a, a moment of, of great change. And uh, I, you know, you, you pose a good question, like how long will this type of spot message exist in a world of uh, the internet? Right. So uh, let me also ask you, I mean, as somebody, you know, as kind of artists, as people who consider this um, aesthetically, how how much are you also trying to tell a story about politics, right? I mean, one of, there was times when I thought you were making certain kind of subtle insider commentary, but I think I was just reading that into it. Um, we talked before, the Marco Rubio spot, the one where he's dancing to these boots are made for walking. Like, I don't know how many of you know that it was long rumored in conservative um, Florida politics that he was gay, right? That was the, the smear that was gonna take down Rubio. That he, and so when I saw that, and I had never seen that before because it didn't, you know, it didn't air in New York and it wasn't in um, that many red states during the primary. To me, that's what this was talking, that's what that ad was about. And it was, I actually made me kind of, I was like, wow, I actually hadn't realized that Jeb Bush was quite that vicious. Um, and I thought that that was why you guys had it there, you know? And, I'm, and I guess I'm curious when you put this together, I mean, is it an aesthetic statement or are you trying to comment about the dynamics of these political campaigns and the kind of, you know, backstories of these political campaigns? Well, I think, uh, you know, Antonio, you, you always speak very strongly about our editing process. I wonder if you want to talk about how the, that shapes what we do. Well, I think the, you know what I feel about than the works they should talk about themselves. 
that, that everything we show here is a chain of decisions of editing, putting this material together is a kind of large collage. And I think one by one, they don't make much sense, but maybe if you relate it to other, I think it's a series of relationship, juxtaposition, and commentaries that it needs to be understand in that way. And that my feeling is whatever we could say now, uh, if it's not there, it don't make okay. any sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we could talk about parallel information, how it's made. Of course, we start in uh, 84, it's 32 years. Every year we get together a bunch of material to the site. And to the 16, I think it's 12 minutes from maybe hundreds and hundreds of advertisements. Like that all the decisions. I think they are there. The editing process is what they do at work. Right. Like that, whatever we could say here is, or we go into the political turf, or we talk about the media, then I think is what our interest is. The work is about how the media is shaping politics. And finally, these portraits of these people are totally, are a kind of simulacrum. Nobody is like this, is being represented. <laughs> right. If we made a, a gallery of portraits in Washington, an instant of paintings of the presidents, we put the spots represent I think it will be a characterize another kind of National Gallery of Portrait in Washington. <laughs> well, right, but if the National Gallery was filled with kind of vicious caricatures made by many of these politicians' enemies, right? I mean, that's the big difference. These aren't just kind of people representing themselves. These are also people representing... Well, many is represented by the political advisors. You know, they are mercenaries. There are people that are today in the United States, tomorrow in Brazil, after tomorrow in Israel. And these people, they don't care any ideology. They are like kind of, you know, are really are changing the makeup of the, each one. Like that, in a way, has a very much about cosmetics in terms of the... Well, who are you talking about? Because, I mean, there are some of these... There, I mean, a lot. I know that a lot of these people work abroad, but... There's not that many of them that are, I mean, some of them, you know, Paul Manafort, some of these people on the right are purely mercenary. Um, you know, there's also the, you know, the people who've gone, who worked for Barack Obama, you know, except there was Jim Messina went for, and worked for, I think. Um, right, but most, yeah. of, but most of them, you know, have gone and worked for left-wing campaigns. Been, most of them have gone and worked for left-wing campaigns Historically, it's been like uh, working abroad. Mm -hmm. Like that. The ideology in every country change, you know, and they go to the economical situation that I think is, I don't think if we want to talk on that. Right. <laughs> but I mean, one, one of the things that, that I think is interesting, like if you think about this as an art form, is that the, the politics, I mean, this interchangeability of the consultants, as Antoni is saying, like working in the US, uh, Messina, for example, mm -hmm. an Obama person then doing Brexit, that the politics becomes plastic too. I mean, it becomes as malleable as the images. And that's where I think we're interested in, in, in playing with these ideas of how, you know, there's an uh, ideology, but then it gets, becomes very malleable. And it, what's doing that? Is it the image? Is it the technology that's making politics malleable? Or is that just the people who make it? And, or, you know? Right, but also, I mean, there's kind of underlying, do you see the images as, be, do you see the images kind of emerging from an underlying, um, an underlying social dynamic or do you see the images as creating that dynamic, right? I mean, because there's a reason why you start seeing some of the same, you know, some of, some of the sorts of things that you saw Nixon, um, that you saw in kind of Nixon's advertisements, you see sort of migrate to some of the democratic, um, 
candidates in the 19, um, in the 1980s, but that was because they, I mean, was that because the ideology is totally plastic or because they kept losing? I and mean, one of the things that I find so striking in that is that you see certain sorts of images almost kind of um, eliminated as if by natural selection. You know, some of, and, and it's especially, you know, I notice it like the, the commercials that would really speak to me inevitably turned out to be the ones that were completely ineffective nationally. You know, the, the one, um, the Vietnamese woman carrying her child, and you see this again, you see it with both McGovern, um, and you, then you see, you, there's later, I think, in Iran, there's a, a, um, a, a Latin American girl, you know, in some right. kind of insurgency. That's so, and and, I think and the basically, the, it seems like the reason that the, you never now see the victims of American foreign wars in any advertisement since then, right, is because they didn't work. Well, I think the, the formats and the strategies are changing, but also repeating. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of quotations. I think it's good to see this in, in a kind of evolution because you start to see the, the morning America right. from Rubio than is it was inspired in the, in the Reagan ad. Let that start to be a kind of inside quotation story. And the strategies, the endorsement, the negative ads, I think that it's been the last 30, no, less, 20 years of negative information, more and more increasing. I think Republicans start that. But finally, the Democrats go too into like that, finally, nobody's talking about what they are doing. They are talking about what, but they are the others. I think that is, uh, what did you take of this? Involvement, involvement of, the, of, the, of the negative ads. You know, I don't know. I would be really curious to see how the advent of um, focus group testing corresponded with the change in the advertisements and the kind of them becoming both like dumber and more manipulative because you know par again part I think part of the thing is that the, the you know these kind of idealistic ads that really spoke to liberal values I mean pr at least until Barack Obama you know for many many years they became associated with failure and you know again and again you saw the most kind of demagogic um, crude, dishonest ads were the ones that appeared to have some sort of impact. And it's also, I think, be, I, I'm curious about the focus group testing because it's difficult sometimes to make a connection between the ad and the success of the campaign that it was connected to, right? I mean, I don't think that we know whether, there's, there's a mythology about John Kerry would have won the election if not for the swift vote ads, but I don't think that we know if that's really true. But I think that what you're seeing is a growing contempt and despair on the part of people who make these ads for the people that they're speaking to, right? A, a sense that people will, I mean, I bet if you even did like a language analysis of, um, you know, particularly in the last few years, I bet it's becoming um, more and more sort of elemental and basic. And it's because, um, you know, there's just very little faith among the people who make these sorts of things that an odd, that the people that they're speaking to can handle an argument with any sort of sophistication um, or any sort of any sort of nuance. Um, you know, and, and often they have good reason for thinking that. I mean, Mike, one of, one of the things that um, we were talking about yesterday that I think is an, a good point you made, and that's how the focus on a authoritarian candidate has shifted. And it made me think, you know, like in the beginning, we see these static cameras, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Eisenhower talking down to somebody, Nixon ad addressing the camera. And this, as, the, as, our, as we've gone through this, there's a multiplicity of, of angles, images, you know, camera angles, right. to the people, it's kind of fracturing our expectations of what a central figure can be. Yeah, and I think you also see a kind of growing awareness of polarization in that you don't have any more, like I'm thinking about that um, Nixon and McGovern ad where the guy is, um, or no, the what did Nixon ever do for me ad, 
Um, you could never have, I don't think, a kind of generic everyman ad right now. You could, all, you could never, or you could also never have a, an ad like the one in New York for Humphreys. I think it was in New York for Humphreys, where you just have sort of ran, totally random people talking about why they're voting for Humphreys. Because you would not, you can't have any more a person who is considered emblematic of all people, right? There is kind of no sense of um, an average. American, right? You would immediately start looking for the signifiers that suggested whether they are kind of part of a red America or blue America, like who exactly they're speaking to. Otherwise, it's, it would just be sort of unintelligible just to have a person testifying on a candidate's behalf. Well, I, th I, yeah, I, I think that, you know, one thing that Antonia and I do is we look at, at, at this material, because we accumulate a lot of it, and we're looking for patterns, for similarities, and uh, the one thing that I've enjoyed working with Montadas on is that he has a, a view, I mean, we have two different views looking at this stuff, and his is like to see more uh, iconic references. So, Antonio, I was just wondering, like, in your sense of, uh, what drew you to, to go into this, delve into this material? I mean, I know you have a, you're working with... <coughs> well, I think uh, all start when I was uh, working at MIT and working uh, at the same time uh, at Diamond, uh, political science professor at MIT, he was doing a book it's called Spots about commercials, political commercial. And I see the book as an interesting uh, approach, but you know, it was the analysis and the commentaries on the spots, and I say, well, maybe it's interesting to see the spots mm -hmm. in instant to talk about. Like that, I asked him uh, access to his archive, and he was very generous. He gave me the possibility to see, and then I start to say, well, this is something a potential to see the story of of that period. I mean, since uh, fifties through the political campaign ads. And I suggest uh, Marshall to work together. And then we start to look the spots from the parties, the different parties, or the archives. And now, most of the things in internet. Right. And that this is the process change in terms of the, of the search. But basically, it was the construction by the media, by these characters and the politics, I think it was the, the interest. You know, you know, I've always been interested in the media landscape, and I think this it was a kind of way of to portray a very specific. Like that the politics clear are the subtext, but for me, the more interesting part is how it's been the media changing that politics. But how, I mean, do you think that the construction of these images and these narratives actually changed politics? Or do you think that the, these images were kind of a product of a changing politics? I think it's a totally construct from the beginning to the end. It's a, it's a kind of fiction. Right, I mean, it's of course it's a fiction. But I guess my question is, do you think it's a fiction that has kind of material effects on the way that, that politics is? Um... Of course it is. Of course it is. And it has to do a lot with the... I mean, you know, the beginning of advertising, it was information. Mm -hmm. Inform about the products. And the consumer buy the product when think he has better information. Mm -hmm. Information is not anymore. It's all a seduction. You buy what the advertising uh, tries to right. convince you to buy this product. Is and this is the same thing here. Is there a um, kind of quantitative or qualitative difference between product advertising and political advertising? Well, I, I, we were in Phoenix, and a friend of ours said, yeah, sex sells products, and fear <laughs> sells <laughs> politics. And so I think that, that that's like a, a simple dichotomy but when you think about it, I mean, that's really, that's a... Right, that's the core the, of it. That, that's the core <laughs> of it. Um, the film is long. <laughs> <laughs> One hour and 30 minutes. Maybe, maybe 
is the time to go. No? Okay. We thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming.